Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Wednesday, April 3rd, 2024. Senator Bernie Sanders joins President Joe Biden at the White House to talk about lowering the cost of prescription drugs. CNN writes the event gave Biden an opportunity to flex his progressive bona fides. Republican Congressman Robert Adderholt calls for a delay in next week's vote for the next House Appropriations Committee chair so that there can be a discussion about the annual spending bill process, which he calls fundamentally flawed. We'll talk about it with CQ Roll Call Budget and Appropriations reporter Aiden Quigley. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell says more data showing that inflation is under control is required before the Fed lowers interest rates. He was at Stanford University in California. White House asked about a Palestinian-American doctor who walked out of a meeting with President Biden Tuesday night in protest of the administration's policy toward Israel in its war with Hamas in Gaza. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg at a NATO foreign minister's meeting in Brussels promotes a plan to convert aid to Ukraine for its war with Russia from voluntary country by country into a NATO multi-year guarantee. And we'll talk with the 2024 U.S. presidential candidate who changed his name to literally anybody else. Story from The Washington Times, President Biden linked arms with Senator Bernard Sanders, a hero to the progressive left, on Wednesday to burnish his brand as Big Pharma's chief nemesis and push for an extension of newly adopted drug savings to all Americans, not just seniors on Medicare. Mr. Biden eyeing a tough re-election campaign is pushing for a broad cap on out-of-pocket drug payments and the cost of insulin, hoping to build on key parts of his signature 2022 legislation. That was from the Washington Times. The program was in the Eisenhower Executive Office building, Senator Sanders praising the president. Despite all of the incredible wealth and political power of the pharmaceutical industry, believe it or not, they have over 1,800 well-paid lobbyists right here in D.C., Despite all of that, the Biden administration and Democrats in Congress are beginning to make some progress. What have we accomplished over the last several years? As a result of the Inflation Reduction Act that not one single Republican voted for, seniors with diabetes are paying no more than $35 a month for the insulin that they need. Beginning next year, that's right. And God knows how many lives that alone will save. Beginning next year, and this is a very big deal, seniors will be paying no more than $2,000 a year out of pocket for prescription drugs. You know, and we all know, we all know seniors who have chronic illnesses, more than one, and are running up huge prescription drug costs that they can't afford. Well, the cap next year will be $2,000. Further, and very importantly, pharmaceutical companies can no longer increase the price of prescription drugs above inflation for seniors without paying a substantial penalty. And, maybe most importantly, for the first time in American history, Medicare is negotiating with the pharmaceutical industry to lower some of the most expensive prescription drugs in America. Senator Bernie Sanders, independent from Vermont and chair of the Health, Education, Labor and Pensions Committee today in the Eisenhower Executive Office building at a program on lowering health care costs, particularly prescription drug costs with President Biden. He and the president also touted the recent announcement that three of the four largest inhaler manufacturers said they would cap the cost of inhalers for many patients at thirty five dollars per month. That came after Senate Democrats sent a letter to the CEOs of the companies demanding information and documents on the costs involved in manufacturing those inhalers. Here's President Biden. Senator Sanders has pointed out one company sells an inhaler for 49 bucks in the United Kingdom. You know how much is charged in the United States for that one inhaler? $645. So I take $645. If you need that inhaler, you get in Air Force One, but the next time I go to London, you can get off and you can get it for... I'm serious. Think, think about that, though. Just think about that. 
for the same exact medicine and the same exact device. It's outrageous. Another company sells an inhaler for $9 in Germany. $9 in Germany. And we pay $286 here in the United States. Nine bucks in Germany. Same outfit. Same company. Same device. And so 30 times more. 30 times more, I repeat, it's outrageous. We're doing something about it, finally. Why in God's name should an American pay $645 for the same inhaler sold in the United Kingdom for $49? By the same outfit. The same outfit. Bernie called out the drug companies during the congressional hearings. And you just heard from Lena Kahn, who's the, federal, the chair of the Federal Trade Commission, who's working with the Food and Drug Administration to crack down on these drug companies. And it's a big deal. As a result of all this action, some drug companies have withdrawn their abuse of patent listings for inhalers and other common products like EpiPens. You know, the last few weeks, some of the big drug companies have gotten the message to reduce the prices for some asthma drugs. Bernie's a big reason why that's happened. In fact, three of the four largest companies are capping the cost of inhalers for many patients. That can be up to $600 out of pocket at $35. There's some progress going on beyond what we've done in the law. But it's about time. And going forward with more competition and more generic drugs in the market, the price could even be less than it is now coming down. President Biden today in the Eisenhower Executive Office Building. A Washington Times article about the program reads, Mr. Biden and Mr. Sanders tried to draw contrast with former President Donald Trump and his GOP allies. The Republican Study Committee, a major block of House Republicans, released a fiscal 2025 budget plan that would attack Obamacare and convert Medicare into a premium support model. Mr. Biden said he is pushing to extend supersized subsidies that made Obamacare more popular and drove record signups, yet expire at the end of 2025. A CQ roll call story begins House Republicans shouldn't rush to pick a new Appropriations Committee leader until they have a fuller discussion about changing the process to avoid massive packages like the long-delayed $1.2 trillion measure enacted before the Easter recess, Congressman Robert Adderholt, Republican of Alabama, said Wednesday. That was written by Aidan Quigley, CQ Roll Call Appropriations and Budget Reporter, who joins us now. Thank you for being on Washington Today. What's the state of this committee chair race? Yeah, so thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, Tom Cole is really kind of the front runner at this point. I mean, he's the only person running. So he really is kind of in a good position. He's the Transportation HUD subcommittee chair and also the chairman of the Rules Committee. He has uh, gotten the support of nearly all of the other subcommittee chairmen on appropriations. But as you you just read, uh, Congressman Adderholt, he's also one of the appropriations subcommittee chairmen. He's interested in running. He has not officially announced whether or not he would run against Tom Cole. But he wants a delay to the vote that's scheduled for next Tuesday on um, who will be the next Appropriations Committee chairman. When he says he wants a discussion about budget changes, has he suggested some of these changes? Not explicitly. I mean, I think there's a lot of frustration about how the process played out this year. You know, it wasn't until last month, March, which is about six months into the fiscal year that, that we wrapped up the fiscal 2024 appropriations process. And, you know, that process was very lengthy and it led to uh, the ouster of one speaker. And now another one might be facing the uh, motion to vacate from Marjorie Taylor Greene that we saw. Um, she brought up or at least put on the table uh, before we started this recess. But I think, I think long story short, you know, they want to try to pass individual appropriations bills which is always a talking point. And I know that Congressman Adderholt has been concerned about some earmarks that some senators put into the appropriations package. So maybe some earmark reforms could be on the table, but we have to wait and and see what he uh, comes up with if he decides to run. Any response from Congressman Tom Cole or Speaker Mike Johnson or other Republican members involved in the election? Yeah, so Congressman Cole told me today that, you know, they don't have a lot of time to wait they, you know, were already behind on the fiscal 2025 process, seeing that, you know, that was supposed to start in February. And, you know, they have hearings scheduled for next week, but it's already April. And there's not a, a lot of time, uh, you know, appropriate to sit down and start writing these bills. 
So, you know, uh, Representative Cole wants them to move fast and have this election next week as originally scheduled. And there's no indication yet that that it will be moved. How powerful is the House Appropriations Committee chair position in the current budget process? I mean, as an appropriations reporter, I think I'm somewhat biased, but I would say it's one of the most important positions in Congress. Uh, you know, the power of the purse is, is kind of Congress's top responsibility, controlling where federal money goes. And the appropriations chairman has a lot of control over, you know, how how Congress spends spends money. So definitely a really powerful position. That said, leadership often is involved in final appropriations deals, sometimes negotiating them themselves. So it really kind of depends on the year. But overall, the position of appropriations chairman is one of the most sought after on Capitol Hill. And it's been pretty fascinating to watch this turn into what either a one man or, or two man race. Uh, so far, only one person running for it. And I, that really goes to show how Cole has consolidated the uh, support. Final question. What does Congressman Adderholt's letter and the disagreement that he has with the appropriations process with what's been going on with Congressman Cole and the speaker say as we head into the fiscal year 2025 cycle? Yeah, so Congressman Adderholt is definitely kind of positioning himself with the members of the House Freedom Caucus and other on the kind of right flank of the House Republican conference and and you know he voted against the big you know compromise spending package that just passed and i think he is you know there's definitely a lot of house republicans who are upset about how the appropriations process is going but when it comes down to it you need to make compromises when you have divided government which is the situation that we're in and the alternative would be to try to do a you know, full year continuing resolution or, you know, the compromise final bills was, you know, the direction that House leadership decided to go in. And it's how we finally wrapped up this lengthy process last month. Reporter Aiden Quigley, you can find his articles at rollcall.com and on X at Quigley Aiden. Thank you very much. Thanks again. And the House Republican Steering Committee is scheduled to meet Tuesday to select the new Appropriations Committee chair. And if there is one chosen, the full House Republican Conference could ratify that choice on Wednesday. The former chair, Kay Granger, Republican of Texas, has stepped down after the fiscal year 2024 spending bills were finished. House Speaker Mike Johnson was interviewed on Monday by a Moon Griffon radio show in Louisiana about how he handled those fiscal year 2024 federal spending bills. The final product is not the bill that Mike Johnson and Moon Griffon would have drafted, right? But here's the reality, okay? This is what everybody's got to understand. Right now, we have the smallest House majority in U.S. history. To advance any conservative policy preferences, I can only lose one vote. Literally, we have a one-vote margin, okay? And because several House Republicans decided last fall it's now acceptable to block our own procedural rule votes, okay, we can't anymore bring our own preferred legislation to the floor to just pass it with a simple majority. We can't even use our one vote majority because instead we have to collect Democrat votes to pass the big must pass legislation like appropriations. That, uh, that's a, what they call suspension vote, a suspension of the rules to bring the vote to the floor. And that requires two thirds of the body to agree. So there you go, right out of the box because our own team has decided we're gonna block our ability to bring our bills to the floor. We have to work with some Democrats or nothing, nothing happens, right? So the Democrats who control the White House and the Senate, remember, Biden's the president, Schumer runs the Senate. We only have control of the House and barely have control of that. They know that when we go into the negotiations process, that I, the House Republicans are not sticking together, okay? So they're on the high ground in negotiation. House Speaker Mike Johnson, Republican from Louisiana, on a radio show in his home state of Louisiana on Monday. From Bloomberg News, Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell signaled policymakers will wait for clear signs of lower inflation before cutting interest rates, even though a recent bump in prices didn't alter their broader trajectory. Powell said recent inflation figures, though higher than expected, did not materially change the overall picture. He reiterated his expectation that it will likely be appropriate to begin lowering rates at some point this year. Chair Powell spoke at Stanford University in California. 
On inflation, it is too soon to say whether the recent readings represent more than just a bump. We do not expect that it will be appropriate to lower our policy rate until we have greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably down toward 2%. Given the strength of the economy and progress on inflation so far, we have time to let the incoming data guide our decisions on policy. We've held our policy rate at its current level since last July, as shown in the individual projections that the FOMC released just two weeks ago. My colleagues and I continue to believe that the policy rate is likely at its peak for this tightening cycle. If the economy evolves broadly as we expect, most FOMC participants see it as likely to be appropriate to begin lowering the policy rate at some point this year. Of course, that outlook is still quite uncertain, and we face risks on both sides. Reducing rates too soon or too much could result in a reversal of the progress we've seen on inflation and ultimately require <clears throat> even tighter policy to get inflation back to 2%. But easing policy too late or too little could unduly weaken economic activity and employment. As progress on inflation continues and labor market tightness eases, these risks continue to move into better balance. As conditions evolve, monetary policy is well positioned to confront either of these risks. We are making decisions meeting by meeting, and we'll do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. The Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell at Stanford University in California. Fed guidance has said it expects three interest rate cuts this year. USA Today's story includes this paragraph. The Fed raises rates to make consumer and business borrowing more expensive. In an effort to curb economic activity and inflation, it lowers rates to stimulate weak growth or dig the economy out of recession. Officials are struggling to balance both of its mandates. After his speech, Chair Powell was interviewed by Arvind Krishnamurthy, Stanford University business professor, and one question was about political pressures. External pressure... Uh, from the Fed, um, from outside, over where to set interest rates. Um, and you have faced this pressure over the last six years, uh, including from uh, the former president. So how do you navigate <laughs> the, the decision-making of the Fed in the larger scheme of pr- pressures coming in from the outside? So the thing is, um, internally, we have peace of mind on this because everybody who works at the Fed knows that we're going to do what we're going to do, and we're going to do it for economic reasons. And that's, that's it, as I mentioned in my remarks. And I mean, I think you can go back and look. You can, anybody can read the verbatim transcripts of, um, uh, of the things that we discuss during. It doesn't, doesn't matter what, what the election calendar is saying. Whatever, whatever's happening in the economy, those are the decisions. We make decisions based on the analysis that I described in my remarks. So I think we know that. So it becomes, but it's a communication issue that people need to understand that that's what we do. It's always what we do. If you look at the modern historical record, you'll see that the Fed has been prepared to move or not move and do what it thinks is is the right thing for the economy in the medium and longer term without regard to kind of outside considerations. And it's important to just have people know that, which is why I brought it up. I'm not, I don't have concerns that you know, that, that it's going to be a problem for us we're go- because we're going to do what the right thing is for the economy over time, and my colleagues and I are tightly focused on that. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell at Stanford University in California. <laughs> Wall Street today, the Dow down 43, Nasdaq up 37, S&P up 5. The Federal Communications Commission has scheduled a vote for April 25th to restore net neutrality rules similar to those under President Obama and then repealed under President Trump. An FCC press release said it will prohibit broadband providers from blocking, slowing down or creating pay to play Internet fast lanes and bring back a national standard for broadband reliability, security and consumer protection. Democrats do have a three to two voting majority on the FCC. The FCC posted this video with the chair, Jessica Rosenworcel. COVID taught us just how important broadband access is in modern life. And at the FCC, we think the way consumers interact with internet service providers should reflect that fundamental fact. We're working to bring back net neutrality, a principle that ensures an open and fair internet where providers treat all online content and applications equally and without bias. This also gives the FCC the ability to protect the internet in the name of national security and public safety. If there's an internet outage in your area, the FCC could now have the power to work with companies to help fix it. 
And if bad actors and foreign adversaries are using our networks for nefarious purposes, we would now have additional tools to fight them. Restoring net neutrality will secure access to a fast, open, and fair internet for all. FCC Chair Jessica Rosenworcel in that video posted today by the FCC and the announcement that the agency will be voting on net neutrality April 25th. Jonathan Spalter, President and CEO of U.S. Telecom, with a written statement. So here we go again. It's been two years since the White House asked Congress and the country to be all in on Internet for all. But just as this goal is now within reach, the FCC is pumping the brakes with this entirely counterproductive, unnecessary, and anti-consumer regulatory distraction. America deserves better. That was from Jonathan Spalter, U.S. Telecom CEO. Washington Today continues in a moment. Hi there. I'm Jonathan from C-SPAN, along with my colleague, Ben. Since C-SPAN's founding 45 years ago, the media world has changed. Remember when there were just a few TV channels? Now we've got streaming, social media, apps, and more. Through all of this, C-SPAN has stayed true to its mission of giving you unfiltered access to government wherever you get your news. As we navigate this challenging media environment with fewer people subscribing to traditional cable packages, our funding has been impacted. That's why we're asking for your help to keep going strong for another 45 years. Please donate today at cspan.org slash donate. Your contribution, large or small, helps ensure at least another 45 years of witnessing democracy in action. Keep C-SPAN thriving in today's ever-changing media landscape. Visit cspan.org slash donate to make your gift today. Thank you. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the C-SPAN Now mobile app that's free and wherever you find your podcasts. An article at CNN, a Palestinian-American doctor walked out of a meeting with President Joe Biden before it was over Tuesday evening, underscoring the high tension, anger, and concern from Arab, Palestinian, and Muslim American communities amid the Israel-Hamas war. Dr. Thayer Ahmad, an emergency physician from Chicago who traveled to Gaza earlier this year, told CNN he abruptly left the meeting that included Vice President Kamala Harris, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, and other administration officials, plus a small group of Muslim community leaders. That was from CNN. Dr. Ahmad was interviewed by CNN Tuesday night. You know, we had shown up to this meeting really concerned about what was taking place in the Gaza Strip, and I'm glad that you mentioned that we were, you know, insisting that there not be any food there. It made no sense for us to sort of break bread while talking about a famine taking place. Um, we had shown up in the president and the vice president, the national security advisor were in the room, and it was very brief comments by the president saying he wants to hear from us and he wants to listen to us. And so I spoke first and I let him know that I am from a community that's reeling. We are grieving and we, our heart is broken for what's been taking place over the last six months. And that the rhetoric that has been coming out of the Biden administration, that's been coming out of the White House, it's frustrated a lot of people, especially people who are Palestinian Americans, Muslim Americans, Arab Americans. We are not satisfied with what has taken place. There has been no concrete steps. But keep in mind, we're very concerned about the people that are over in the Gaza Strip that are in Palestine right now, who are not just starving, but are facing the threat of a looming Rafah invasion. And so I was able to share that with the president and let him know that out of respect for my community, out of respect for all of the people who have suffered and who have been killed in the process, I need to walk out of the meeting. And I want to walk out uh, with decision makers and let them know what it feels like uh, for somebody to say something and then walk away from them and not hear them out and not hear their response. Wow. I mean, what did, how did President Biden respond to that? You know, there wasn't a lot of response. He actually said that he understood and I walked away. And I think, you know, for me, just like many of the other Palestinian Americans and Palestinians, or as I mentioned, many of the people who are interested in what's going on, we're panicking. Dr. Thayer Ahmad on CNN Tuesday night. ABC News writes the White House meeting behind closed doors was followed by a small iftar dinner to mark the end of the daily fast during Ramadan with Muslim administration staffers, but not with the community leaders. And that the events are a very scaled down gathering to mark Ramadan. Islam's holiest month compared to previous years when the president would host hundreds for a reception and deliver remarks in front of guests and the press. Neither the meeting with Muslim community leaders nor the iftar dinner were on 
President Biden's public schedule. That was from ABC News. The White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre got questions from reporters today at her news conference about what happened last night. Does the president think the meeting he had last night with Muslim leaders um, was useful? And is there any reaction or comment on a Palestinian-American doctor walking out in the middle of that meeting? So let me just say a couple of things just at the top about last night and how important it is. As you know, the president and the vice president, they continued their tradition of honoring the Muslim community during Ramadan by hosting a meeting with Muslim community leaders to discuss issues of importance to the community. Let's not forget. Uh, This is uh, the sit down conversation. The meeting was asked and it was supposed it's supposed to be private. They wanted a private meeting. That was something that uh, as we have done our outreach, as you know, senior White House officials have been doing this outreach. The president uh, and the vice president have been in communication with uh, the community uh, regularly since October. And this is something that they asked. They asked for a private meeting, a working meeting, if you will. And so we understand what's how this community is feeling. It is deeply painful moment uh, for many in the Arab and Muslim communities. Uh, The president also expressed his commitment to continue working to secure an immediate ceasefire as part of a deal to free the hostages and significantly increase humanitarian aid into Gaza. And the president made clear that he mourns the loss of every innocent life in this conflict, Palestinian and Israeli. The president and vice president committed, uh, are committed to continue engaging with these leaders moving forward. As I mentioned, we've had regular engagement uh, with uh, members of those communities. Uh, as it relates to um, the, the part of the question that you just asked me about a participant walking out, look, I want to be really careful here. We said that we would keep this, these uh, conversations private, so I'm not going to continue, I'm not going to comment on a, uh, any private discussions. Uh, but. As I said many times from this podium, uh, the president respects an uh, American, any American's right uh, to peacefully protest, and uh, we are going to continue to have these conversations, obviously, uh, with that community. Go ahead, Nancy. Thank Thanks, Corrine. How did the White House decide who would attend the Attar dinner? So uh, what I will say is um, I want to be careful here. Uh, you know. This meeting, again, was decided uh, after we had done outreach for some time now. Uh, we wanted to make sure that this was a private meeting and that uh, participants had an opportunity to be, um, you know, to be, to be honest and to be able to share their thoughts and feelings uh, about how, um, you know, how, where they are, how they feel about the situation happening, obviously, in the Middle East. Uh, I don't have a, a process uh, to lay out how uh, the list came about, uh, and so I you know, don't have anything to, to lay out in that realm. But as you know, and as I, as I stated a couple of times, we've done outreach. Uh, for this past several weeks, several months, uh, to the Muslim, to the Arab community, Palestinian community, and um, and heard from them directly. And they spoke, we listened, and uh, we hope that they feel like they had an opportunity to express themselves and had an opportunity uh, in front of the president and the vice president uh, to talk about an incredibly painful time. The White House Press Secretary, Corinne Jean-Pierre, at her daily news conference in the White House briefing room. Story from AFP, the bodies of six foreign aid workers killed in an Israeli airstrike were on Wednesday taken out of Gaza to Egypt for repatriation, a security source said. As Israel faced a chorus of outrage over their deaths, the Israeli military killed seven staff of the U.S.-based food charity World Central Kitchen on Monday in an attack that U.N. Chief Antonio Guterres labeled unconscionable and an inevitable result of the way the war is being conducted. The remains of the six international staff who were killed alongside one Palestinian colleague were taken in, in ambulances to the Rafa crossing to Egypt, where they were handed over to representatives of their respective countries. The security source said on condition of anonymity. One of those workers was American. That was reporting from AFP. The Israeli Armed Forces Chief, Ertzi Halevi, in a video called the attack a grave mistake. The IDF completed a preliminary debrief. I want to be very clear. The strike was not carried out with the intention of harming WCK aid workers. It was a mistake that followed a misidentification at night during a war in a very complex conditions. It shouldn't have happened. This incident was a grave mistake Israel is at a war with Hamas, not with the people of Gaza. We are sorry 
for the unintentional harm to the members of WCK. We share in the grief of their families as well as the entire World Central Kitchen organization from the bottom of our hearts. Hertzi Halavi, chief of the general staff of the Israeli Defense Forces, posting that video. U.S. President Joe Biden writes Reuters will speak by phone with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Thursday, three days after Israel launched an attack in which seven World Central Kitchen aid workers were killed, a U.S. official said. The White House has described Biden as outraged and heartbroken by the attack, but the president has made no fundamental change in the United States' steadfast support for Israel in its conflict in Gaza. And that's the story from Reuters. The U.S. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller took more reporters' questions about this at his news conference in Washington. Reuters just, um, we have an interview with Jose Andres actually just uh, on our wire. And he told us um, that the Israeli army targeted the convoy, quote, systematically car by car. Um, And, you know, President Prime Minister Netanyahu talked about this being a mistake and unintentional. How do you reconcile those two, the reporting and what Jose Andres is saying and what Prime Minister Netanyahu is saying? So two things about that. So um, number one, the chief of staff for the Israeli Defense Forces has come out and said it was a misidentification. So while they were, I took that to mean, mean while they were targeting those cars, they did not believe that it was the World Central Kitchen that was operating those vehicles at the time. Um, but that said, we need to wait and see the, the outcome of this investigation to, to know with any confidence what it was that happened, and we're going to wait to do that. But the second thing is, the second point is, it doesn't really matter how they made the mistake. At the end of the day, you have seven dead aid workers who were there trying to deliver humanitarian assistance. So whatever the reason was that led to this tragedy, whatever the the mistake that happened inside the IDF, it's unacceptable. And they need to do better, and they need to put measures in place to ensure that it doesn't happen again. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller at his news conference. This is Washington Today. From Al Jazeera, NATO members have agreed to start planning military support for Ukraine on a long-term basis. Urged by Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg, a meeting of NATO foreign ministers agreed on Wednesday to move toward guaranteeing long-term weapons deliveries to Kyiv. However, proposals to establish a $107 billion five-year fund met resistance from some quarters. The alliance chief said allies agreed to move forward with planning for a greater NATO role in coordinating security assistance and training. The move would give NATO a more direct role in coordinating the supply of arms, ammunition, and equipment to Ukraine as it fights Russia's invasion. That was the article from Al Jazeera. The Secretary General Stoltenberg spoke to reporters earlier today. Europe now faces war on a scale we thought was assigned to history. In recent days, the Kremlin has launched new major attacks, striking Ukrainian civilians and infrastructure, and Russia continues to press along the front lines. So we must stand firm in our support to Ukraine. And I welcome that allies continue to make major deliveries of weapons, ammunition and equipment. But Ukraine has urgent needs. Any delay in providing support has consequences on the battlefield as we speak. So we need to shift the dynamics of our support. We must ensure reliable and predictable security assistance to Ukraine for the long haul. So that we rely less on voluntary contributions and more on NATO commitments. Less on short-term offers and more on multi-year pledges. Therefore, ministers will discuss how NATO could assume more responsibility for coordinating military equipment and training for Ukraine, anchoring this within a robust NATO framework. We will also discuss a multi-year financial commitment to sustain our support. This ministerial will set the stage for achieving consensus on these issues as we prepare for the Washington summit. NATO allies provide 99% of all military support to Ukraine. So doing more under NATO would make our 
efforts more efficient and more effective. Moscow needs to understand that they cannot achieve their goals on the battlefield and they cannot wait us out. NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg. NATO is marking its 75th anniversary this week. Story from Bloomberg News, a U.S. House vote on Ukraine aid isn't likely until at least mid-April and possibly later, with Speaker Mike Johnson still searching for ways to soften opposition from Republican hardliners, multiple party leadership officials said. Johnson raised expectations for a quick action in a Fox News interview Sunday, saying the House would move forward with Ukraine assistance right away when lawmakers return next week from their two-week Easter break. That was from Bloomberg News. The Undersecretary of the U.S. Army, Gabe Camarillo, was asked today about the effects on the U.S. military of not approving additional aid for Ukraine. You know, the uh, Ukraine supplementals, a lot of talk about that, and we all hoping for sure that, uh, that it passes. But let's say it doesn't. What's the, what's the impact on the Army, and particularly in the area, not just uh, impact on the Army, but how it affects the uh, defense industrial base modernization, and also uh, how it would impact critical munitions that are needed both in Ukraine and for, yeah. for us elsewhere. No, thanks for bringing it up. Um, you know, we always say that uh, the, the need to pass the supplemental is absolutely cru- crucial, not just because we're supporting Ukraine and it's absolutely vital that we support uh, Ukraine in this conflict against Russia. Uh, not passing the supplemental would have devastating effects to the United States Army. Mm-hmm. And let me explain why. Uh, As I've said before, uh, many of the current operations costs that we are currently um, uh, undertaking in the Army, for example, all of our support mission to NATO and deployments to Europe, that cost has been, up until December of 22, paid for by supplementals. Since December of 22, we have been uh, essentially cash flowing I'm sorry, December of 23, we have been cash flowing a lot of those costs with our own internal Army funding. So uh, until the supplemental is passed, you know, we have a running tally, and I'm looking at General Mark Bennett here from uh, Army Budget Office. It's, it's around the nature of 500, north of $500 million at this point uh, that we have been essentially cash flowing to date for these operations costs. We need that supplemental to reimburse us because that's essentially operations funds that we cannot use for other things that we had planned to do during the course of the year. So what does it impact? It impacts things like exercises that we had planned in Europe and the Pacific. Uh, it affects you know, operations activities at the unit level uh, that they want to do, other, other areas where we have to take risk because we're cash flowing mm-hmm. these costs. And the second example is you know, the area of procurement that is in the supplemental. This is all through the replenishment funding. Hmm. Um, you know, we had said very clearly, for example, the need for 155 artillery to be able to produce it at a rate of 100,000 rounds per month by the end of 2025. We can only get there if two things happen in the supplemental. First of all, if we get some of the investment for facilities that are in that bill, and again, that goes to domestic uh, sources like uh, Army ammunition plants at Scranton and at Holston and some of our vendor base. The other thing that we need are the procurement of critical munitions, which is part of the mm. supplemental. Mm. So uh, it's vital to the industrial base. It generates jobs here in the United States. It supports our ally in Ukraine, and uh, it, it definitely reflects our commitment uh, to mm. that cause. So it's, it's vital for the Army that we get that supplemental pass. Gabe Camarillo, Undersecretary of the U.S. Army at an Association of the U.S. Army program in Arlington, Virginia today. Story from the New York Times, President Volodymyr Zelensky of Ukraine has signed into law three measures aimed at replenishing the ranks of his country's exhausted and battered army, including the politically poisonous step of lowering the age when men become eligible for mobilization and eliminating some medical exemptions. Russia's forces have been on the offensive along the front line, and Ukrainian generals have warned of a broader attack in the spring or summer, even as Ukraine's army runs low on ammunition and many soldiers have been on continual combat duty for two years. That was from the New York Times. In the race for the White House every four years, there are candidates from major political parties, minor political parties, and independents. And that could run well over a 1,000, according to Ballotpedia.org. One of the latest to enter, a 35-year-old man from Texas who changed his name legally to literally 
anybody else. C-SPAN spoke to him this morning. Take us through how you became literally anybody else and uh, why you decided to throw your hat in the ring here uh, and change your name and enter this race. Well, it was one of those things that felt like somebody had to. You know, after the last two presidential elections, we've had like one of the highest one of the highest dissatisfaction rates with just the choice of candidates. And, you know, first time that's kind of expected. Second time, you know, you're just you really start to get frustrated even more. And now that we're on round three of just completely undesirable choices, you know, this tweetism has got to stop. And so with that in mind, you know, it wasn't an immediate thing. It wasn't as soon as I had the ideation to change the name that it's happened because that's my identity. That's something, you know, very serious. So as it progressed and got worse and worse, it kind of, you know, as that weight climbed the hill, once it reached the peak, you know, it was, I felt like somebody had to do something. Formally, step up and, yeah. formally Dustin E.B., currently literally anybody else. What's your background? What qualifies you to run for president? Well, I don't have any background in politics, really. I did an internship for Kay Granger for a while when I was at TCU. Uh, other than that, my hands-on experience with politics is is not really there. But that's the beautiful thing about American government is that you don't have to have experience required as long as your heart's in the right place and you have you know the mental capacity to make those connections because that's what it should be about you know if we're if the government's meant to be a government of representatives then why don't the people represent us anymore why don't why doesn't congress and the president why don't the two presidents represent a majority of the people it doesn't make any sense so i hope to bring that you know as a teacher as a veteran i can connect with far more people i can relate to far more problems than they ever could. An interview on this morning's Washington Journal on C-SPAN. You can find all of our 2024 presidential election coverage at cspan.org. Click on Campaign 2024. And thanks for listening to Washington Today. If you subscribe to C-SPAN's free evening newsletter, word for word, you'll get the stories that are making headlines in Washington sent to your inbox every day. You can sign up at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night.